Basically, on the distal humerus, there's two different articular surfaces. One articulates with the radius, and one articulates with the humerus. And then the troclea is what's on the ulnar side, and the capitulum is what's on the radial side. You have the radial head, and then if you think of it, a cap a capitulum has the word cap in it, which meaning, meaning a hat or a head, right? So the head of the radius wears a cap. So that's the capitulum of the humerus articulates with the radius. And then the trochlea on the ulnar on the radius articulates with the ulnar. I'm going to grab the skeleton out of there. Sure. Okay. So and then what's going to be important also is the medial and lateral epicondyles. Those are these parts that stick out here. If you come down the humerus, you'll feel these two bony things that stick out. Right? And they're not part of the forearm because they're not moving here. If your radius and ulnar are going to move here. You can feel this bony part that sticks out right here. Which condyle would this, or epicondyle would this be? Medial or lateral? Medial. So then lateral epicondyle is here. Right? And you've heard of lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. Right? That's basically that's attaching right here. And then you have the coronoid fossa which is on the front here, or this part of the... This is the coronoid process. Let's see. Coronoid process. So remember, this is coronoid, this is coracoid. The coronoid is this little bony, this little pointy part that sticks out on the ulna right here. And then that goes into the coronoid fossa. And then you have the lecranon on the other side. That's part of the ulna, and that's going into the lecranon fossa. Okay. Those aren't really things that are necessarily going to palpate. Not so much of the coronoid, but obviously you can palpate the lecranon, and then the fossa that it's going to go into is going to be the lecranon fossa. So basically to review the, of the humerus, what's this rounded surface up at the top here? The head, right? And then you have the anatomical neck, which is right where the base of the head is, but then the, what they call the surgical neck is around here. And then what are this, these two lumps here? Tuberosities, and which one's lateral? And then the lesser is medial. And then what's the groove in between? I think we call the biceps groove or the intertubicular groove. And then you have the deltoid tuberosity, which is where the deltoid attaches. And then when we come down here, you have two articular surfaces of the, of the humerus. Which one goes to the radius and which one goes to the ulna? Something that goes to the ulna. The, uh, the trochlea goes to the ulna, and the uh, capitulum is to the radius. Right. And then what are these right here? Okay. The condyles. And then actually what you call this, these two ridges right here, the epicondylar ridges. Because this is the actual condyles down here is the articular surface. These are the epicondyles, and these are the epicondylar ridges. And the reason why you have those, these different names of the actual epicondyle and the ridge and, and all this and that is because there's different muscles that attach to those different spots. There's muscles that attach all over on those different areas. And we kind of already went over this when we talked about the axial skeleton, but just to review, we've got the enubrium right here, right? And then the body of the sternum and then the diaphragm process. And then the different landmarks, and these are things you need to know for palpation, is what's this one right here? The jugular or the supersternal notch. And then you have the clavicular notches, which is where the clavicle is attached to the sternum. And then you have the sternal angle right here. That's the part that pops out. Like if the top of the sternum is this way, and then the, the manubrium is here, and the body is here, it kind of has a different angle that you can feel. 
and then you have the xiphoid process. And then, it's not in here, but it was in the other part, axial skeleton, the other landmark is the costosternal angle, which is right here. That's where the rib and the sternum, the angle between the two parts of the rib cage. All right, so now we'll talk more about the ribs. And again, we talked about this a little bit before. It's basically a rounded bone that wraps around the rib cage like this. So it has the rib head, and then the neck, and then the shaft is this long part coming over here where it attaches to the sternum. And then we talked before about some of them that attach directly to the sternum or above the true ribs, and then we have false ribs, and then floating ribs. All right, so now we'll talk about the joints of the pectoral girdle. And you basically have, there's three true joints and two functional joints. So the main joint when you think of the shoulder is this one here. And you're always going to name joints by the two different bones that are not necessarily always bones, but the surfaces. Instead of calling this the scapulohumeral, you call it the glenohumeral joint. Because more specifically, the glenoid fossa is the part of the scapula that articulates with the humerus. So the humerus is sitting right here. So that's a ball and socket joint. Everybody remember what ball and socket joints are, right? Mm -hmm. right? They're multi-axial. And the shoulder is more, is one of the, has the most mobility of the joints in the body compared to the hip, which is a deeper ball and socket joint. And then you have the AC joint or the chromioclavicular joint. Right? And that's going to be where the clavicle articulates right here. So if you have an acromioclavicular joint on one end of the clavicle, what do you have on the other end of the clavicle? Mm -hmm. Sternoclavicular. Right. And then actually, there, there's some cases there is more than five. Sometimes we'll talk about the sternocostal joint, which is here, where sometimes the, shoulder, the movement of the shoulder does involve a little bit when the first rib articulates with the sternum. And then you have the scapulothoracic joint, and that's one of the what's called a functional joint. Question? Um, is there any like, method to, like, you know how the sternum is first and then the clavicle? Is it like removal outwards, or is there. As far as what? Like the way they name it, like sternal clavicle. Oh, mean which name comes first and which name yeah. comes second? Um, No, because I mean, if they, here they call it a chromioclavicular, and then here it's called sternoclavicular. Uh, I don't know if there's a I mean, like a special rules that he follows, which one comes first, and which I don't know. I just knew it because I just always call it sternoclavicular and sternoclavicular. I mean, like so then. The scapula thoracic is where the, um, the scapula articulates with the rib cage here. And I'm working on making a model. I'll just use this because you can see through it, so it's easier. Okay, so this is where the scapula articulates with the rib cage. So it's not a cartilaginous joint, right? It's, it's muscle, right? And then here's your clavicle. And then the other functional joint you have is what's called the subacromial joint. We should have it on the next slide. Well, it's, called, it's either called suprahumeral, meaning above the humeral, or subacromial joint, meaning below the clavicle. And it's this passageway right here. Right? So it's basically coming through here. And then that's going to be significant. It's more of like a clinically significant type of thing because you're going to have structures that get impinged under there. You can have the supraspinatus tendon, the subacromial bursa, and then also the long head of the biceps. And then the borders of it, to understand that, you also want to understand the, this area here, where this is the acromion process, and this is the coracoid process, 